public information conducted a poll in which 23 percent of the respondents selected Park as the most respectable historical figure. The results of various surveys and polls indicated that a positive reappraisal of Park Jung Hee was emerging or beginning to emerge, which was promptly dubbed by the mass media as Park Jung Hee syndrome. A number of prominent intellectuals in South Korea argued that the syndrome was caused by Koreans' reputed penchant for forgetfulness, the Korean people basking in economic development and high incomes had all but forgotten the price they had to pay to achieve the economic prosperity they now enjoyed. So if Frederick Nietzsche called 19th century Germany a case of hypertrophy of history, that is, Germans had an excessive attachment to the past, these scholars were saying that South Korea of the 1990s was suffering from perhaps a hypertrophy of memory, saying that an antidote to this forgetfulness was the presentation of the true history of Park Jung Hee period. And here, for the moment, I would have to bracket what is history, what is memory, what are the differences between memory and history, which has a vast amount of literature and for which I really don't think I have time to go into. My purpose in discussing the syndrome is neither to reconstruct the course and politics of this widely discussed phenomena, nor to substantiate or disprove the relative truth of the claims and counterclaims of historical representations of the Park Jung Hee period, I am primarily interested in looking at the syndrome as a window through which to explore issues related to cultural or social production of historical consciousness, of um, consciousness outside the academy, especially when they are mediated by representational idioms of popular culture, and the wider questions the syndrome raises about the status of historical knowledge and its related questions on the relationship among history, public memory, historical consciousness, and the role of historians. And if you are interested in the issue of Park Jung Hee syndrome, there are now a vast amount of literature available. Unfortunately, they are all in Korean. Um, um, but there is a lot written about the Park Jung Hee syndrome itself. Now, the 20th century Korean history encompasses widely divergent trajectories and experiences, and the Park Jung Hee period alone encompasses the two extremes, that is, the state's brutal suppression of human and civil rights, people's vehement and persistent demands for democracy, and the rapid economic development of the time. The seeming incommensurability of these divergent paths in one's lifetime, with all of their contradictory images, and implications present historians with enormous challenges as to how to think about this past and how to reflect upon it. The challenges, that is, the intense political, emotional, and intellectual stakes of interpreting the past is perhaps one of the reasons why there is currently a relative lack of historical analysis of the Park Jung Hee period in South Korea, again, relative to this abundance of public discourse or public memory of the Park Jung Hee period. South Korean society is also increasingly dominated by the proliferation of memory culture, where professional historians have a limited impact on the public in terms of historical knowledge or even how to think about certain historical issues or period. The Park Jung Hee syndrome suggests, among other things, that real histories of the Park Jung Hee period existed outside academia. And obviously, as this is the case with many other countries. Historians have also developed different ways of telling the story of the Korean past, selecting alternative instances, emphasizing or downplaying specific issues, and delineating divergent conclusions and lessons from them. The previously dominant nationalist narrative, deeply embedded in the construction and legitimization of the nation state, and in the Cold War um, anti-communism, has gradually lost its intellectual credibility as well as its moral authority.
Mindum historiography, the politically progressive offspring of the nationalist narrative, has also been closely associated with the successive democratic regimes, um, giving rise to contentious debates in Korean society about the nature and role of history in shaping the present and future of society. And yet few eras in Korean history have seen more divisive and fractured representations in both historiography and popular memory than the Park Jung-hee period. And as many of you in this room would know, Park Jung-hee is one of the most controversial figures in post-1945 Korean history. Beginning in 1961, he rules South Korea for over 18 years, first as the supreme leader of the military junta, that had carried out a military coup on May 16th against a democratic elected government. He then donned a civilian cloth and served as president of South Korea since 1963 until he was assassinated by the director of Korean intelligence uh, agency on October 26, 1979. The era of the Park chung hee regime was decidedly an era of violence represented by its draconian Yushin constitution and emergency measures. It was through the suppression of civil and human rights that the will of the state was imposed and realized. At the same time, however, the Park Chung Hee region was the first and most effective modern state in the history of Korea. In the process of massive mobilization of its citizenry, the state showed itself to be capable of modernizing and inducing voluntary participation of the citizenry, not only through coercion and suppression, but also, and perhaps more effectively, through the cultivation of its image as rational and nationalistic. So the complexities of the Park jung era cannot be captured by the binarities of the domination versus resistance or authoritarianism versus democracy that has characterized much of the scholarship of the era until recently. The Park jung system as the first modern state in Korea attempted to monopolize consciousness and behavior of Koreans through the modern mass political mechanism and discursive practices. One such practice was the discourse of egalitarianism that accompanied the modernization project in which the widespread desire and collective will of Koreans to eliminate poverty and to live better lives join with the populist urge of Park jung hee Unlike the previous leaders of Korean politics who flaunted their elitist background, Park jung hee repeatedly emphasized that he was a son of a poor peasant and therefore one of the people. His life presented a phenomenal success story and gave hope to the majority of Koreans who at the time were deprived and alienated. The developmental mob mobilization from the top was thus intimately conjoined with the desire of a large number of Koreans. As such, as South Korean scholar Hwang byung ju aptly characterizes, Park jung hees was not only the politics of repression, but also the politics of desire. For many, Park's personal story was their own story, his successes and his failings, his humble background, his ambitions, his checkered life and ultimately his fate in some ways reflected those of the country itself. So the questions of what Park jung hee represents for contemporary South Korea, his conflicting legacies and the various meanings attributed to his policies have become all the more salient and controversial for South Korea since the early 1990s and especially since the economic crisis known as the IMF crisis. How have Park's authoritarianism and the accompanying economic development been remembered in the context of the subsequent disappointment with the democratic reforms that also accompanied drastic measures to restructure economy, otherwise known as a neoliberalism. How do memories of the Yushin period shape the responses to rebuilding democracy? How have these memories, both sociological and psychological, that is collective and individual, been shaped in social changes? Uh, has been reshaped in social change as well as political changes. <laughs>
But we also have to remember that what South Korea has witnessed in the last decade or so, whether it is hypertrophy of memory, is all too, fa all too familiar a story and not unique to South Korea. Historian Anne Louise Shapiro talks about contemporary society as a slightly schizophrenic moment when there is both considerable worry about historical illiteracy, cultural amnesia, and intractable presentism, the loss of meaningful history, and an equally powerful sense of history as everywhere present, such as in films, museum exhibits, theme parks, among others. She states that these worries, that there are too little and too much, are in fact not two different sets of problems, but aspects of the same larger concern, that the wrong kind of history that is wrong-headed or simply wrong is producing an unfortunate kind of historical consciousness. As Shapiro put it, the issue is not that people have forgotten the past, but that they have misremembered it all too well. Not that they don't care about history, but that they don't or can't discriminate among the available virgins." Unquote. So what was at stake in the ensuing public debate about the syndrome were obviously questions about whose memories will prevail, which accounts are the most accurate, and how particular meanings are conveyed and others ignored by specific kinds of representation. Professional or academic historians did not define the terms of this debate, as far as I know. The syndrome clearly indicated that the traditional Korean historians claim to a privileged role in shaping national or cultural identity that was popularly accepted in the 1970s and 80s was no longer the case. This claim sprang largely from historically specific experience of the period in which intellectuals, especially those who had aligned themselves with the erstwhile democratization movement, known as the Minju movement, played a critical role in shaping historical consciousness of university students and, and critical intellectuals. So during the height of the democratization movement, uh, critical reevaluation of modern Korean history was an integral component of the social movement. And so the democratization movement itself was very much a process of discursive contestation between socially sanctioned memory and counter-memory, between the state discourse of dominant nationalism and the Minju movement's oppositional nationalism. And during this period, the historical experience of Koreans was mostly interpreted in, absolutely, in absolute binary categories, the state memory and counter-memory, which historian John Bortner calls official memory and vernacular memory, with all the attendant problems that such neat dichotomy entails. The transition to parliamentary democracy in the late 1980s in South Korea and the accompanying worldwide changes, including the advent of neoliberalism, brought a palpable diminishment of the intellectual's privileged status as a moral identity, collective intelligence, historical agency, and cultural force. The dominant mode of intellectual's social participation also changed in the 1990s from the earlier political to cultural. So if the concern of the 1980s uh, for theory, praxis, if the concern in the 1980s was for theory, praxis, and politics among intellectuals, those concerns were replaced with the 1990s celebration of sensitivity, spontaneity, and consumption. So instead of arguments and heroic stance of intellectuals exemplifying the notion of jiheng ilchi, that is correspondence between knowledge and conduct, then the originality of ideas, the ability to digest imported theories were now in demand. In place of the political activism of the 1980s, popular culture came to be regarded as the key domain of resistance with the emerging category of cultural critique elevated to the position of cultural guerrilla. Uh, 
This paradigm shift was embedded in shifting material conditions and geopolitical conditions. In this paradigm shift, the categories of the 1970s and 1980s, they were held effective and workable, such as official memory and counter memory did not carry the same meaning, nor have much political relevance. Um, but we also have to consider another context, that is that when South Korea made a transition from uh, an authoritarian dictatorship to a parliamentary democracy in the late 1980s, it also accompanied or um, the breakdown of the existing socialism in Eastern Europe. The worldwide transformation heralded or preceded a concomitant demise of the left and Marxist social theory and political Marxism which also resulted in the questioning of the premise <coughs> of modernity and the rise of mo post-modernity. So the post Minjung era in South Korea is not only post-authoritarian and post-modern, but also post-ideological with all that it implies. So if we think about this change uh, in the larger context, uh, the world's revolutionary experiences and revolutionary discourses have to a large degree been discredited over the, fast, over the uh, last few decades. From uh, Francois Furet's critical reappraisal of the French Revolution to the charges of excess um, in the Chinese re Cultural Revolution, which tends to be equated with the Chinese Revolution as a whole, the rise of the discourse of failure and excess or access of revolutions have had profound consequences. The discourse of failure, China scholar Erich Dolik argues, not only calls into question one of the founding moments of modernity, but also casts doubts on all revolutions, regardless of political orientation and the aspirations and visions that endowed revolutionary changes with meaning. One of the unintended consequences of this is to deprive revolution of its social legitima legitimation, its claim, in other words, that it was a product of social forces and gave voice to the aspirations of the oppressed in society. Revolution appears now as a political act that may even have gone against deepest social aspirations." Unquote. More recently, Christine Ross has argued that the official history of May 1968 has depoliticized and dehistoricized the ethical event, effacing the class struggle that was perhaps the most important part of May and presenting it as a generational conflict of revolt of the young against the old. Although France's largest and longest worker strike constitute one of the major events of May 1968 and exposed the contradictions of contemporary capitalism, it is mainly discussed in the context of fulfilling long repressed individual desires and psychic needs. Thus the significance of the events are reduced and its unexpected possibilities foreclosed. It is seen as a mere derailing in France's inexorable march toward capitalism and cultural modernization. Ross writes, following this teleology of the prison, official history thereby eliminates the memory of past alternatives in which we could get a glimpse of outcomes other than the ones that actually took place, unquote. To invoke Minjun in the changed landscape of post-1987 Korea is to be charged with invoking cliches and platitudes. The term Minjun immediately and usually brings to mind images of the streets strewn with broken stones and Molotov cocktail bottles, the ubiquitous riot police with their Darth Vader-like gear, and the angry and strident shouts of down with military dictatorship that galvanize the youth on streets and university campuses. These images are becoming increasingly blurry with the passage of time, highlighting the vast distance the country has traveled over the years, politically, socially, and culturally. 
South Korea of today is a country that is democratized with a highly developed economy that competes in the international arena and has been touted as a model to be emulated in China, Southeast Asia, and many of the former socialist countries in Eastern Europe. And that lures thousands of migrant workers with the promise of South Korean dream. It has all the trappings of postmodernity, and as philosopher Park Yong Gyun puts it, is a country that is entering the era of pleasure after the previous era of lack. In this context, it is not surprising to see intellectual community beset by shifting paradigms and shifting alignments. The previously demarcated lines between the so-called nationalist school and people-oriented Minjung school in the field of Korean history and between modernization theory and autonomous development in the field of social science began to blur. There is clearly a sense among historians and many intellectuals on the side of the uh, former Minjung group that the antagonistic structure of the intellectual and social paradigm that had previously existed in some sort of an equilibrium began to tilt advantageously toward the conservative position. Its voice is not only getting louder, but also more confident. That is the voice of the conservative. Consequently, there is a growing concern that the conflicts and confrontations surrounding historical interpretations are not merely academic issues, but rather point toward larger divisions in society, the division between those who welcome the worldwide changes of globalization and neoliberalism, and those who see the need to change the status quo and worry about negative consequences of globalization and neoliberalism. For example, Kim il Young, a political scientist, articulates this concern rather dramatically. Quote, the hegemonic struggle for historical perspective can be a determining factor for determining factor in our path for the future, that is, progress through reform or retreat through compromise, unquote. Now, going back to the Park Chung-hee syndrome, it should be pointed out that while the syndrome may have been mass-based, it certainly was not spontaneous. As in any public debates of critical issues, the mass media, especially conservative press, which had been openly hostile to the reform movement of the Kim Young san played a central and deliberate role in shaping the content and form of the debate, and thereby reconstructing the public memory. Critics have pointed out that numerous public opinions and surveys conducted by mass media, which began prior to the full-pledged appearance of the syndrome in spring of 1997, in fact, contributed to and constituted the syndrome. Mass media certainly was not the only medium. There were multiple ways to produce the past and their effects on historical consciousness. Various cultural forms have increasingly become what Ellen Feldman calls historiographical apparatus, which possibly even displays and certainly function as a prosthetic for professional historians' history. However, in 1997, during the height of the Park Chung-hye syndrome, the arena constituting the con condition of possibility for any dominant memory and its contestation was mass media. The power of mass media in South Korea is such that a well-known political scientist, Choi jang -jib, argues that political agenda in South Korea is set by mass media. It's also the mass media that determines policy issues and priorities. It's the mass media that also conducts ideological inquisitions, according to Choi jang -jib. Um, so by the late 1990s, conservative newspapers became the main medium through which the revisionist view of Park Jung-hee was voiced and propagated. Uh, and here I use conservative, and I'm sure this is a term that invites a lot of contestation, but for the moment, I'll just go ahead and use conservative newspaper, Joseon Yebo, um, uh, or, or characterize Joseon Yebo as a conservative paper. The conservative Joseon Yebo serialized Park jung hees biography by Cho Gap-jae, uh, a well-known journalist and editor-in-chief of the paper. 
And another paper, Chungang Ilbo, um, Central Daily, also serialized the memoir of Kim Jong Nyum, who has served as the former Minister of Finance and Secretary General of the Blue House, that is the presidential residence for 10 years. These personal reminiscences, memoirs, and biographies led an effective campaign of revisionism to promote what they called a new era in South Korea's history with the active participation of political leaders such as Park Jong-hee's daughter, Park kun hye When Korean literature professor Lee In-hwa published his novel based loosely on Park Jong-hee's life called A Man's Road, Ingane Gil, it was the mass media that catapulted it to the center of public discussion, which in turn helped to generate more public interest in the former president. Now in these retellings, Park Jong-hee emerges not only as the able statesman who accomplished the dual task of industrialization and modernization, he's also a revolutionary figure possessed with the highest degree of integrity, an incarnation of justice as well as a tragic figure. Most importantly, Park Jong-hee emerges as a fervent nationalist who devoted his life to embodying the Korean people's Han, the long accumulated suffering, sublimating his plebeian but uncompromising spirit for the nationalist cause. His death by a trusted right-hand man is also considered a revolutionary martyrdom. Um, and here I have some discussion about the shifting uh, perspective of Park's place in Korean history, but I think I can skip that. Um, it was from 1997 that the hagiography of Park Jong-hee in various genres began in earnest. The previously mentioned Central Daily, that is Joseon Yilbo, began to serialize twice a week for six months the veritable record, Park Jong-hee, which contained personal recollections of various individuals who knew Park personally or had served in his regime. This collection, similar to the previously mentioned 30 years of Korean economic policy, is noted for its unrestrained idealization justifying most of the policies and conduct of Park Jong-hee as historically and politically necessary and inevitable. Unlike the previous discourse of, of Park Jong-hee that focused on his accomplishments as statesman, the narrative of the new publications portray Park almost as a superman. The previously mentioned Cho gap serialization of his long-awaited biography of Park spit on my grave is an exemplary case. Cho's interest in Park began with his publication of the posthumous work in 1987 and Park Jong-hee in 1992. As others have noted, one can see clearly that Cho's assessment of Park Jong-hee has gradually become more hagiographic. In the posthumous work, for example, Cho considers Park Jong-hee as a Confucian pragmatist, an important <coughs> historical figure who would remain in our history in thick Gothic font. But Cho also points out that Park lacked historical, um, I'm sorry, philosophical strength to sustain himself when he found himself alone and suffered from dualistic sentiments. In the 1997 biography, however, Cho portrays Park as a superhuman who held his spirit high, a first-rate thinker, a bashful hero, superhuman with much tears, a plebeian everyman, an indigenous Korean, and finally, a revolutionary who sublimated the national su nation suffering with his personal energy for modernization. Chogapje here effectively reorganizes South Korea's modern history in Hegelian trajectory. The nation's history is the manifestation of the infusion of the will of the individual Park jong hee and national destiny. In fact, during his lifetime, Park jong hee often appealed to this notion when he tried to justify his political actions or policies. As he flagrantly defied uh, democratic rules, Park jong hee claimed in public that he was indifferent to public opinions or pressures since he was above any popularity contest. 
This had the effect of directly connecting his political actions to what philosopher Hong Yoongi calls another super reality called national history. Soon after the military coup, in bemoaning the social chaos created in the aftermath of the April 19th uprising, Park Jung Hee expressed his sense of responsibility to congeal the will of uh, the public for national salvation. And this is uh, what he says, if this chaos continues, it is inevitable that our country will be communized, that our 5,000 years of history and tradition will certainly disappear, and that I would be ashamed to face the lofty spirit of our forerunners who wish to make their descendants prosper through bringing national revival, unquote. As Hong yoong points out, Park jung here likens himself to a miracle performing shaman who has received the direction not from the heaven but from Korea's 5,000 years of national history. This notion of Park jung as someone who has transcended his individuality for the higher call of historical responsibility is most pronounced in Lee Hee Ra's novel, A Man's Road, published in 1997. He's a professor of Korean literature at Iwa Women's University. Lee Hee Ra belongs to the much discussed 386 generation, that is the generation that was born in the 1960s, were active in the 1980s when they were university students, and, w and, and they were in their 30s when this term was coined for the first time. Um, and that's why it's called 386 generation. Um, he belongs to that generation that led the democratization movement in the 1980s, which was responsible for South Korea's transition from military dictatorship to parliamentary democracy. This generation collectively sacrificed much for South Korea's transition to democracy. So Yi's portrayal of Park jung as a heroic figure was therefore the first to publicly counter the collective memory of that generation by someone who belongs to that generation. In an interview, Yi hin stated that he wanted to write a national literature, Kungmin Munhak, about the nation state instead of issues such as freedom of our democracy, quote unquote. So the Yi's literally representation of Park jung hee in the novel verges on a kind of mythic religious transcendence as well as a metaphysical foray into death. Yi hin presents Park jung hee as a prototype of a human destiny that conquers good and evil. Park has led an extremely checkered life. He graduated from the Japanese Manchurian military school at the age of 28, was accused of being a secret military agent for the South Korean Communist Party and sentenced to death at the age of 32, led the military coup that toppled the democratically elected government at the age of 45, and ruled South Korea until his death at the age of 63. E, the novelist, proposes that Park jung hee sought to find salvation for his moral blemishes, that is his service to the Japanese Empire by serving the state and by his sacrifice. Park jung hees moral blemishes are also sublimated to the power of death. This power of death drove him to run toward the, quote, narrow and treacherous road of national interest without looking back. Only the urgent task of the era, that is the nation's prosperity, was a way for his salvation. According to E, in the face of this superhuman transcendence, based on the metaphysics of death, any rational interest in political legitimacy would be an object of ridicule. Um, there's yet another novel. Um, Obviously, I'm very interested in novels. <laughs> um, th I just wanted to introduce another novel um, that has captured the imagination of the Korean public and spawned public debate over Park jung hees legacy. Title, Sharon Rose Has Blossomed, 무궁화 꽃이 피었습니다. This novel was published in July 1993. Four million copies were reportedly sold within the first year of its publication, the highest number sold of any title in the history of South Korea. And this novel is also considered a must-read for university students. The novel's plot involves a U.S.-based Korean nuclear physicist, Lee Yong-hoo, who returns to South Korea 
giving up the prospect of receiving a Nobel Prize for his work at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in the U.S. to help Park jung hee realize his quest for nuclear development. But Lee Young-woo is killed, presumably by the CIA. Lee young is based on the real-life figure of Benjamin W. Lee, a well-known physicist who was actually killed in a car accident um, in the States. Actually, it's, it was in near um, Chicago in the 70s. The novel also implies that Park Jung-hee's 1979 assassination is also possibly connected to the CIA as an attempt to foil the underground nuclear testing that was scheduled for August 18th of 1980. In the novel, Park jung is a heroic nationalist for whom national interest is of supreme importance. Park's quest for nuclear weapons is also presented as a nationalist quest as well. The author also addresses the circumstances that led to the writing of this novel. And that is his frustration over South Korea's declaration of the Korean Peninsula as nuclear-free during the Sixth Republic by Rotewu government, which he concluded was forced by the United States and over the foreign and defense policies of South Korea, which he claims were dictated by the Pentagon. His unstated wish for the emergence of a strong leader that matches the leadership and charisma of Park jung hee cannot be clearer in the novel. The novel was a bestseller in 1993 and 1994, and its author, Kim Jin Myung, was selected as the second most favored author in a 2000 Gallup survey. It was later reported that the impact of the novel was such that many of the university students who read it were found to have harbored strong anti-foreign sentiments and had confused the imaginary solutions offered in the novel as a realistic alternative for South Korea. For example, Kim ki uh, conducted a survey of 300 university students comparing those who read the novel and a comic book called Southern Invasion and those who did not and found that there is a significant difference in terms of their views toward the appropriateness of pertinence of declaring the Korean Peninsula as nuclear free, the justifiability and the need to cooperate for the possession of nuclear weapons by both North and South Korea, the possibility of attack by Japan, and the attitude toward the United States, among others. Interestingly enough, both Sharon and the Southern Invasion, which is the comic, deal with the themes of the danger posed by superpowers around the Korean Peninsula, a war between South Korea and Japan, and cooperation between North and South Korea against the invasion of Japan. So I, I understand that it is time to wrap up. Um, so instead of offering any conclusion, uh, let me just uh, read some of the things that I've been thinking about uh, in connection to this uh, syndrome. And as I said before, South Korea is um, presently a country of procedure democracy and advanced capitalism with the resulting differentiation in class structure and proliferation of multiple subjectivities and desires. It is also a society of consumer capitalism and popular culture, where much of public discourse is I initiated and mediated by the mass media. With the public's increasing demand for the instant historization of anything and everything, historians can no longer and do not wish to claim any authority over historical matters or privileged access to truth. The past is increasingly becoming another commodity and its mass consumption is becoming effectively a means for reconstituting the society. In the realm of popular memory, the recollection of the oppressive authoritarian regime are increasingly reorganized by the teleology of modernization and significance of Minjung movement is reduced to an inconvenient but necessary detour in South Korea's march toward capitalism and modernization. So in this context, I think it was really important, uh, it is important to probe into the mechanisms of South Korea's Park jung hee syndrome. Um, and I think the debate should have functioned as a, as a moment to critically re-examine the present state of democracy by exploring the still existing forms of oppression, the various power relations that include regionalism, 
uh, academic cliqueism, nationalism, aspirations for developmentism, and patriarchy. And the debate also should have been an occasion at another level, a historiographical self-questioning, um, challenging the dominant nationalist and also supposedly more progressive Minjung narratives. Uh, I think it is important for us to uh, go back to the moment of the Minjung movement, uh, not because that we need to revive the means of its uh, democratic and revolutionary uh, um, uh, movement, um, but to um, but because I think this moment, in a way, serves to or to to to. Um, <sighs> well, this is because I've. I am the one who wrote about the Minjung movement. Perhaps this reflects my particular perspective, but um, in some ways, I think the the Park Chung Hee syndrome, rather than exploring all these issues, uh, in some ways ended up or served ended up serving to legitimize the contemporary structure of power. Um, so I think we need to, in a way, look into the the Minjung period. Um, in some ways, the Minjung was a term that was imbued with the, what someone says, glaring utopian vision of emancipation. Um, the, pro the project was a vision that called for activities and states of mind that, to quote Henry Lefebvre from a different context, attempt to achieve the total realization of a possibility. So given, given the continuing and ruthless drive for efficiency and market competition in Korea. I think it is, um, intellectual, uh, it is incumbent upon historians and intellectuals in, in, in South Korea in general to examine what's going on with the Park Chung Hee syndrome. Um, that to make sure that much needed and quite justifiable criticism about what went on with the oppositional movement um, serves not the status quo, but the critical purpose, making it possible to resist the current dominant system and to envision the possibility of an alternative. I, I'm not suggesting I have any clear-cut answer uh, to all the questions that I had posed, uh, but this is sort of a th larger context in which that, that I try to think about these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. My question is this: uh, In America, uh, you know, we have the conservatives, uh, to use your term, and the, and the liberals. And in the Georgetown cocktail circuit, if anyone from Fox News goes too far, I mean. The, they've got counter strategies, whether it's NBC, ABC, CBS, or, or the Academy, to not allow such revisionists, let's say, uh, to use an example, uh, uh, myth on people like, let's say, Richard Nixon, who to many people, even in death, his name is still mud, at least in, by a particular segment of society. But my question is, you mentioned the Chung Oyobo, but I was wondering, where was KBS? Where was the academy? Where were the professors during all this? This seems like a rush of between 97 and maybe 2001, 2002 to glorify this man who many, myself included, consider not a leader but a monster. So my question is, where was everyone else standing on the sidelines? It reminds me a lot of the nationalistic movement that occurred in Germany. Uh, of course, that went to the extreme because that's what created a hero out of a monster like Hitler. But to allow this to happen in Korea, when he was such an oppressive dictator, um, it, it boggles my mind. I'm not even Korean. Um, but <laughs> I know enough about Mr. Park to know that uh, he, he, he's not a, he wasn't ever a leader. He was a ruthless dictator. And he tortured many people, and he made life miserable. Yes, Korea became more modernized. 
But where were the opposition during this time? Well, that's precisely the point, in a way, of um, my presentation, that I think historians and intellectuals in general tend to approach this problem as a, as a, as a project of enlightenment. And again, that's not particular to South Korean intellectuals. Um, those of you who may be familiar with the German history in 1959, Adorno had an article about how to reflect upon the German history. And basically, his approach was to have more cognitive development. It's a very much of an enlightenment project that the more people know about what really happened in German history, people would know, the young people would realize the evils of the Nazism and evils of Hitler. That was not necessarily the case. It was not the lack of evidence. It was not lack of memory. Um, it was refusal to engage in that kind of historical issue and serious, with any kind of seriousness. Uh, so I think part of the problem has to do with, with obviously this enlightenment approach that we have to approach history differently and that we have to differentiate the way that the public, what I call public production of knowledge, uh, approaches history, the emotions that are involved in, in approaching this kind of historical issues have to be separated. And so there was that kind of unwillingness on the part of historians to engage themselves in public arena. Uh, I mean, I think it has a long history in the sense that this was relatively a current issue that involved the current regime. And so in, 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 in the historians sort of disdain of getting involved in present issues, I think was certainly one of the issues, right? Uh, and ironically enough, Chogap Jez, the eight volume serials on the, and Park jung life is one of the most detailed uh, as far as I know, and one of the most um, comprehensive account of Park jung hees life and his contribution thus far. There has not been any kind of counter argument put forth by the scholars in South Korea. So I think there is that sense that historians should not necessarily involve themselves in present issues, is regarded as a presentism, which I think is, again, something that you know we should talk about. But um, so there is that sense, and this is too much of a recent event for historians had to have that kind of objective perspective. Um, and they just, didn't want it to get into the mud. Uh, the, the, I mean, clearly, what has been going on with the serialization of Joseon Ilbo and Jungwon Ilbo are clearly so hagiographic that to get involved in the discussion would have been, um, you know, dignifying what they consider to be, again, a non issue. So I think that, I mean, I'm not. You know, I think that's part of the reasons. There are, of course, other historical reasons and the circumstances in which this Park jung syndrome came about. We have to remember the 1997 is the IMF crisis. So many people are getting laid off and intellectuals are basically blamed for not having predicted this terrible tragedy. And for many in South Korea, this is remembered as the second most difficult period in Korea's modern history. Uh, that it compares to the experience of the Korean War for many of South Koreans. So this was a very difficult period for many South Koreans, uh, I, which made it all the more difficult for intellectuals to be involved in the debate. And, 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 and not to mention the power of mass media in South Korea. They buy off people. Um, I remember I was asked to contribute to a, a critical journal called Tangde Bipyeong at the time. And uh, I was about to, uh, you know, submit my article, and then it got sort of disbanded. And the, I realized the reason why was because one of the editorial, one of the the board members, had contributed an article for the Joseon Ilbo. So the entire editorial board decided that they weren't going to be involved in that journal anymore, uh, because again, Joseon Ilbo is so far out there that why would you? Why would you contribute anything to that Joseon Ilbo and thereby contributing 
to or sustaining or helping to sustain the power of Joseon Yilbo that it has on Korean society. Um, so there is that element among the intellectuals. We don't want to get involved when Joseon Yilbo is involved. But the t thing is, I mean, the, the eight volume series that I mentioned, Spit on My Grave, again, is one of the most comprehensive uh, account of Park Chung Hee and, and his various legacies. And, and I, as far as I know, uh, there has not been any kind of counter effort. Although there is a, another intellectual movement that I should perhaps mention, and um, that is that in from the 19, late 1990s, 70s, uh, I'm sorry, from late 1990s, a group of intellectuals. And interestingly enough, um, these intellectuals or historians are not Korean historians. Are Korean historians necessarily. These are the historians who study uh, European history. And they are the ones actually who got together. They formed themselves into a collective and began seriously to look into the Park jung period. And the group now is called sort of mass dictatorship group because that's the sort of a, a larger framework they work under. And that is to see, I mean, their basic framework is whether or not the mass during the Park Jung-hee period participate in the Park Jung-hee uh, regime. Um, and you know, it great, uh, there was a great deal of controversy. And again, I think very few intellectuals and historians wanted to get involved in this. Uh, things are changing gradually. And uh, this is not to suggest that I blame historians for their lack of courage or anything like that. It's just there are a lot of issues that obviously that we need to think about. Uh, but those are some of the reasons that I can talk about now. Um, I don't know if I gave you a sufficient uh, answer. Um, yes? I'm wondering if Korea is not such an extraordinary state. Not at all. Most modern states started out as strong states or dictatorship or quasi Yes. Yes. So there's a lot of selective history. Yes. So looking at the ability for, I, I think Park Chung Hee was able to adroitly coordinate and to control institutions like the bureaucracy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and forcing certain things to occur. Right. Forcing modernization, forcing modernization of education and things like that. And so is it so much a revision of things other than that? Or mm. it, are they just simply highlighting his ability? and not highlighting some of the other abuses of his that he did. Do you understand what uh -huh. So is, is there a differentiation between those two different um, instances? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think I, I think I understand your question. Um, I am not sure um, from what I read if they make that distinction in and everything, right? And mm -hmm. that's, that's really, you can argue against that. Mm -hmm. But you can say, holding all else constant, holding all those abuses constant, he did well in this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a differentiation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is actually a recent publication that attempts to do precisely that, I think. Um, although the problem with that, I think, as soon as you mention about Park jung as a as a state builder um, and holding things constant, as you put it, and then it sort of begins to invite all host of questions about, well, what about this and what about that? So uh, there are some attempts by political scientists and sociologists. And, and the most recent attempt that I can think of is the, actually, this has been translated into English. Um, and I can't, I can't seem to remember the name of the main author, but in any way, so there's a collection um, that uh, talks about Park jung not simply as a human rights abuser, but also in terms of his efforts for state building um, and nation building. So yes, I, 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 yeah, there are 
I don't know how clearly people make distinctions, but there, there are efforts, I think. Yes. Uh -huh. So that might be a backing of the Park Sunny's um, syndrome because, I mean, the younger generation hasn't really gone through major crises e except for the economic crisis, but um, like the older generation have gone through war and Korea is a very new, newly developed, developed mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think, I think there's a disjunction between like the economic and social development mm -hmm, right, and mm -hmm. like, political developments that could actually mm -hmm. support um, other progress in mm -hmm, the area. Mm -hmm. So um, whenever there's like um, a crisis, like the global crisis, economic crisis, I think like the older generation is afraid that the country is going to kind of like sure, sure. collapse a little bit. Of course. And, so and those are legitimate concerns yeah, for sure. um, for many of the South Koreans, right? Uh, especially, again, after experiencing the IMF crisis. Uh, so those are very legitimate concerns, and uh, um, and um, <laughs> you know I, I, what I always say is the tragedy, in some ways, as far as I'm concerned about the South Korea's transition from authoritarianism to democracy, is that it had to accom accompany the neoliberal regimes, right? And because both. Kim Dae-jung and Noh Myon government had the higher authority, or seen as having more authority, seeing because they're seen as a democratically elected, and because the leaders were uh, previously involved in democratization movement, that in some cases, in some ways, that made it easier, or if you put it different way, more difficult for any kind of serious critique of neoliberal re regime to appear in South Korea. <laughs> Right? So if you look at what's been going on, especially with the labor movement, um, it is during the Kim Dae-jung period where the labor movement gains, in some ways, citizenship for the first time in South Korea's history. The KCTU, for example, which had been an oppositional labor movement, which had been illegal for a very long time, becomes legal in the mid-1990s. And yet, what happens is that KCTU would have to be competing equally with the management, with the capital. Um, and so, yes, you gain a citizenship in South Korean politics, and yet you are all of a sudden asked to compete equally with the capital. And uh, there's a tremendous problems and issues with that. Um, so, <laughs> and it was during the Kim Dae-jung era where KTCU was legalized, right? So there, there, there are a lot of issues, obviously, and uh, the economic issues are a real concern for many of the South Koreans, making it, again, difficult for these issues to emerge or to have the people engage in these issues. Uh, when so many people are un unemployed and when there's so much of a gap between the poor and the rich, how would you possibly begin to talk about the legacy of Park Jung hee in a different way, for example? I think it's, it's a very difficult issue. So I'm, I'm aware of such <laughs> constraints. Uh, I'm not just criticizing the intellectuals uh, or historians for that matter. Yeah, so you mentioned the magnificent numbers of Um, my view about yeah, uh, Park Chung Hee himself. Yeah, I, no. Ah. Uh. Park Chung Hee is a dictator uh, and a nationalist. Uh, you mentioned two types of mm -hmm. dictators. And uh, I still think that the syndrome is uh, lingering in uh, South Korea. Um. Again, I am not necessarily concerned with the syndrome per se, um, and uh, it's possible that uh, it might have faced some 
demise. I, as, I, I'm not sure if, if what we know as the Park Seo-jin syndrome of the ni late 1990s is still continuing in the same magnitude. Um, however, my main concern on, with this uh, presentation is um, to look at the syndrome as a way of looking at, again, what's going on in terms of how people think about history, what historians think about their role in society, public memory, and those kind of issues. And I'm not necessarily interested in the syndrome um, in itself, per se. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can say the Park Jung syndrome is still in existence in the same form and in the same magnitude as in the 1997. I, and I think I acknowledge, and I didn't have chance to elaborate on that issue, I do acknowledge that it is a particular product of the particular political, social, economic circumstances of the 1990s, late, 19, uh, late 1990s. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he's the second position mm -hmm. in this MD government. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is the uh, syndrome is still going on in Korea and people's mind? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, you can say that. As mm. a historian or academic, how can you think about the um, about the lingering effect of uh, Park Jung-hee syndrome. Uh, again, I, I would like to emphasize, again, this is not necessarily particular to South Korea. We've seen historically, for example, I mean, if you look at for Italy, Mussolini's granddaughter um, also emerged as a very powerful political figure uh, in the 19, is it, uh, 1980s or so. Um, and of course, much of her presence and um, her popularity is attributed to particular problems that Italy uh, was facing at the, at the time. Um, so again, I, I don't want to characterize this as a particularly uh, South Korean phenomena. I think throughout history, we've seen reemergence of figures um, such as Park Jong-hee or Mussolini, for example, um, in particular. Um, social historical circumstances. heavy-duty issues that, um, that I, I've been struggling but have not been able to really find any sort of concrete uh, um, solution or concrete way to talk about. So, I mean, I think precisely that's an issue at this point, isn't it, in South Korea, that 
when we talk about intellectual paradigm shift. We're not just, I mean, when we talk about political paradigm shift, we're not just talking about the political issues, this intellectual, and in some ways epistemological as well. So these are the issues I think that many in South Korea are struggling with, or I shouldn't say many, some <laughs> in, in South Korea are struggling with. And Yeah, exactly, right? Because the in a way the terrain of the historical uh, questions and uh, debates have been shifted again and again. So, I mean, s there is a sociologist who claimed that we need to rescue history from Korean soap operas and historical dramas, for example, because the survey shows that's where most of South Koreans get their historical knowledge. Um, so I think historians would have to come to terms with these changes that are taking place. And, and, and you know, in some ways, um, um, historians are notorious for not wanting to deal with these changes. And I, I see very few historians wanting to deal with this issue. Um, but the question still remains, I think, um, as to how or can the Enlightenment project, which was in a way epitomized by the intellectuals' role in the 1970s and 80s, can it still sustain? in the um, changing era. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We're not sure. I am not sure. <laughs> um, in some ways, you have to see that there are diverge, you know, divergent aspirations and multiple subjectivities and desires uh, that are popping up in South Korea, right? You see the gay parade, for example. You see all these lesbian women forming into collectives. Uh, you, you see all this array of these fascinating developments that are taking place in civil society in, in South Korea. And yet at the same time, you see, in a way, the politics of South Korea reversing <laughs> itself back to the f authoritarian regime to a certain degree. Well, at least that's my take on it. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult uh, for me to be able to sort of clearly articulate in one way or another uh, how you respond to that. Uh, I'm still struggling. But thanks for raising that issue. <laughs> Contextualizing mm. this historical uh, re remembering in um, this particular moment of the 1990s and early 21st century. I'm not sure I, I saw, though, the ways in which uh, the re reconstruction mm. uh, ha is, in fact, distinctly postmodern or whatever label you want to give it. I, I think of the way in which in the early 20th century uh, the Civil mm. War was mm. reimagined mm. uh, in the historiography of the United States and the mm -hmm. popular memory. Mm -hmm. uh, the way in which the German Revolution was reimagined even a decade after, or less than a decade after it happened in Weimar Germany. And historical memory is something that's been politicized for right, right. a very long time right. and in ways that sound very similar to what mm -hmm. you're describing. Mm -hmm. So, what is it about your story? Mm. That's a very good question because, I mean, even in, in Korean history, if you look at it, Sangguk uh, or Sangguk Sage, those, what we call the historical material of the early period, were written much after the, f uh, the facts, and, and they are, in a way, that re representation or popular imagining of, of Korean history. So, this is not necessarily all very new. Uh, or particular to South Korea. But I think it is important to note the centrality of the mass media, I think, in initiating and, and mediating the public discussion. 
Um, I think that's something ca that's quite new uh, in, in South Korea, uh, although I wouldn't necessarily say that that's particular to South Korea. Um, so mass media, um, the you know, abundance of historical films that now come out of South Korea, for example, um, the historical dramas um, that many South Koreans watch, uh, if not novels. Novels, I don't think, is all that new. I mean, even in the 70s and 80s, novels were, in some ways, the only medium through which any kind of counter-memory can be represented. So no historical novels were very popular. Uh, but the historical dramas and, and films, I would have to say th that that's pretty much new in, in South Korea, that is, if not necessarily, um, you know, it's particular to the 20th century. The, yes? I have one comment. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, to answer your first question, um, I don't necessarily claim that the democratization movement was all that democratic. Actually, I spent a great deal of um, pages in my book talking about undemocratic characteristics of the uh, Minjoo movement. I, I do, however, make a claim that it was important, in fact, central to the transition from the authoritarian regime to um, procedural democracy in South Korea. I, I don't think that one cannot take away that from the democratization movement, regardless of how you think about it. Um, so 
I don't necessarily disagree with, with you on that point. Um, and as you well um, articulated, it is true that despite the democratic aspirations, there were many practices that were very undemocratic, sexist, and um, hierarchical, patriarchal, and whatnot. And in fact, there are increasing number of literature that talk about these issues in South Korea. Um, as to the second question, I don't think that um, we can necessarily say that because of this sort of large number of people who are involved in the Park Jung hee syndrome, that that was sort of a predominant sentiment of South Korea at the time. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure the political scientists will give you a better sense of why it was that Noh Myeon was elected at that particular time uh, when he was elected, and there are many, many obviously interesting issues to consider. Uh, but just because Lee Myung Bak became president after certain years, that doesn't mean that the, the, the kind of nostalgia that people felt for Park Jung Hee period was in, in, in or should be negated or should be taken lightly. I mean, I, I, you know, the IMF crisis, I think, was just a huge factor in South Korean psychic. Uh, in, um, Unless we understand the impact of IMF crisis, I think it would be very difficult for us to understand what went on post-1997 in South Korea. Um, so I, I um, and, uh, you know, many political scientists would tell you Ewan Bach's issue was economic, right? It was not political per se that th those economic concerns drove people to vote for Lee um, Myung Bak. Right, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but you know, no one could deliver what Park Jung Hee delivered. I mean, he was product of not only his ideas and policies, but also the global context, right? That's not going to be possible under any Regime, no matter who becomes the president in South Korea. So, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for the thank you. thank you so much. Um,